Thank you for joining our Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences Conversation Series. My name is Dr. Annemieke Vernorst and I'm the Associate Dean Research in the Faculty. The title of today's seminar is How did Can Canadian food and agricultural markets hold up during the pandemic? Looking back after one year. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Inishnabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, and Dene's peoples, and on the homeland of the Metis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Today marks our sixth faculty seminar in a virtual format. And if you missed our previous seminars, there is an opportunity for you to view them via our faculty's YouTube uh, channel. As another option, you can also find links to the seminars at our wonderful knowledge translation portal called Manitoba Agriculture and Food Knowledge, knowledge Exchange. For your reference, uh, you can actually see or hopefully we'll see sh uh, shortly the website address uh, on your screen. And there it is, makemanitoba.ca. MakeManitoba.ca highlights our faculty's research as it relates to consumers and producers. And we do so through a series of podcasts, infographics, fact sheets, and even delicious recipes. So please do check it out. So today we have three speakers who will share with us a short summary of their research and then engage in a, a conversation. You as a viewer can participate in this conversation by sending in your questions and comments via the chat platform. And right now I would like to call upon Crystal Jerkinson, who is our communication specialist, to provide some guidance on how the audience can participate in today's presentation. Crystal. Thanks, Anamika. Um, so today, uh, as we are listening to the conversation, uh, we would love it if you could chime in with your comments and your questions, which we will uh, deal with at the end of the session. To do that, you'll visit slido.com. You'll see that URL at the bottom of your screen. And when you get there, you'll want to enter the event code, which is hashtag egg markets. Uh, that will put you into our uh, event and you can enter your questions there. Just be aware that the, the uh, character count is a bit limited, so keep your questions and comments as succinct as possible. And just to start, it, start us off, we'd love to hear where you're watching us from. And we'll come back to this later on, Anamika. Thanks, uh, Crystal. That's uh, that's really uh, useful. Uh, and thank you for providing these uh, these instructions. So today's topic explores a look back one year after the pandemic began at how agricultural markets have held up. COVID-19 pandemic imposed an unprecedented shock on the global economy. The early months of the pandemic were characterized by uncertainty and fear. There was a concern about the capacity of food and agricultural markets to provide a reliable supply of food at stable prices. This led to a call for transformative changes to food and agricultural policies in response to these concerns. And in the spring 2020, our three guests that are participating today uh, were also uh, involved in a special issue uh, that uh, was um, provided by the uh, Canadian or published by the Canadian Journal of Agricultural Economics. And our three guests offered their expertise of how the markets would navigate the pandemic. Fast forward to today, the journal is now publishing a follow-up special issue in May 2021 that looks back at those expectations. So with the extra benefit that there is actually a year's full of data and experience. So today our speakers will outline some of the major points addressed in the special issue and discuss how Canadian food and agricultural markets have done. <clears throat> 
And now I would like to introduce to you our first guest, uh, which is, please welcome, Dr. Ryan Cartwell. Ryan is one of my colleagues in the faculty. He is a professor in the Department of Agribusiness and Agricultural Economics at the University of Manitoba. He holds a PhD in Agricultural uh, Economics from the University of Saskatchewan. His research interests are international trade policy, international food aid, and the economics of food policy. He teaches courses on the economics of food policy to diploma, degree, and graduate students. So with that, over to you, Ryan. Great. All right. Thanks for the introduction, Anamika. So I'm going to kick the session off here by briefly describing the special issue uh, that Anamika mentioned and the forthcoming one. I was a co-editor of the special issue with Alan, who you'll hear from. He's the managing editor of the journal. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the motivation for the special issue and just a few takeaways from, from some of the articles. Um, so, you know, as economists, we are quite used to thinking about the economic effects on markets of things like production shocks, a crop failure or a change in trade policy, a trade barrier or a new subsidy. Uh, this was a, a new challenge for us. So the, the shock imposed by COVID was, was unprecedented in the source and in the scale and in the scope. Um, and these uncertainties were magnified by public health uncertainties that, that uh, went along with it. Um, so of course there was a lot of uncertainty early, you know, just over a year ago when this thing started. And so into that void, into that void of uncertainty came a lot of voices on suggestions and policies. And a lot of those um, voices fell along sort of two broad themes. Uh, one of them suggested that uh, food production and food security and safety were seriously threatened by the disruptions that may be coming from the pandemic. Um, and some of these voices called for very transformational changes in policies such as trade barriers, subsidies, uh, regulations on scale, and things like that. So there was a lot of a lot of uh, discussion related to this. This is a taken out of a New York Times column uh, by uh, an academic at, at University of Waterloo, actually a Canadian academic. So that was one sort of uh, thread that, that we saw a lot of. Another thread that was quite common. Um, this is another example. Was that farm incomes and production would be jeopardized by by coming disruptions. And so we also heard a lot of calls for um, an increase in, in government provision of, of public subsidies to industry and to farmers as a preventative and, and as a response to the pandemic. So, you know, myself, Reed, I read a lot of this at the time, and um, I felt that a lot of the commentary that I was reading was um, perhaps unwarranted and even worse, perhaps misguided and, and may have resulted had it been followed in, in policies that made things even worse. So with that motivation, um, Alan, who you'll hear from in a few moments as a managing editor of the journal, Alan invited several senior uh, researchers in, in the field in, in the uh, Canadian ag economics community, actually, and some from the US, uh, to write focused articles on some very specific issues related to uh, specific sectors in agricultural uh, markets in Canada and, and abroad um, to sort of harness our economic toolkits and our institutional knowledge and focus those on what we think might play out, how might the system hold up, given the, the um, uncertainties that we face, or that we did face a year ago. So this, this special issue came out a year ago, and just in the past few days now, we've started to post follow-up um, articles to this original issue. They'll all be available within probably a week or two. And in this follow-up issue that, that is available for free, by the way, on the website, Open Access, uh, the authors have returned to these original articles and looked back with new data, um, some some more information, and tried to evaluate, you know, how how did it hold up given what what the author suggested a year ago? How did things do? Um, so those that are interested, please go to the the journal website. These articles are all open access, and all of them should be available uh, within just a few more days. So you know, I'm just going to speak very broadly about some of the um, some of the main threads coming out of the the special issue. Uh, well, of course, there were obstacles. So how did the system hold up? There were obstacles, of course. It was a truly unprecedented shock. Um, you know, some common threads that transcended several sectors and, and um, supply chains included a transition from food service to retail. So 
um, commercial cafeterias and restaurants were, if not closed, certainly reduced in scale. So that created a lot of obstacles on things like package sizing and distribution. And Jill, who you will also hear from today, will spend some time talking about that. Um, there were also very well documented and publicized meat processing uh, constraints. So um, outbreaks of disease in meat processing plants, which closed some of them, shuttered some of them for a, a period of time. Um, so that had some important effects. We've seen evidence that that has reduced uh, or at least applied downward pressure on farm gate prices for animals and upward pressure on consumer or wholesale prices. Uh, at the beginning of this, there was a lot of concern about international border thickening, a, a phrase that economists use to describe when governments reduce or increase trade barriers, right? So either through import barriers or export restrictions. Thankfully, that didn't happen as much as a lot of people feared. Um, and I'll show you a slide on this in a moment. Uh, trade continued more than, than a lot of people anticipated. And then of course, consumer income. So income is, is the most important determinant of, of food demand and of uh, food security. So there were serious concerns about that at the beginning of the pandemic as well. And we, we have an article in the special issue that addresses exactly this and, and talks about how consumer incomes certainly went down for some people, but get some government responses uh, ameliorated some of that. Um, and so there is an article specifically related to that in the special issue. So, you know, in looking at any system, food system or set of policies that go into a system, what we need to do to understand how effective it is is compare how it did on some measurable output relative to how these outcomes would have would have uh, occurred in an alternate system, right? An alternate system, which of course doesn't exist. So what, what I'm gonna do is just show you a few sort of broad level aggregates, you know, big picture takeaway um, pieces of information on how the system fared under current conditions. And you know, for more detail on comparisons, I would urge you to go to the special issue and look at some of the, the uh, articles in the paper. So here are just some very top line aggregates that people are typically interested in evaluating, you know, how is the system holding up? How is the market doing? Uh, so on the far left, we've got crop production indexed to um, the level of production in 2010. And so I've highlighted there in that red box the 2019-2020 the crop year. And you can see that with the exception of canola output of, of these three field crops were up, right? So of course this masks some diversity and heterogeneity among different products, but broadly speaking, food production at the farm level was up and strong in, in, in the last year. Uh, the second figure looks at exports. So how did, how did trade flows hold up? This is just exports, I don't have a figure on imports here, but you can see that in 2020, Canadian exports of agricultural products was at or near a record. So borders did not get thicker or close as a lot of people anticipated that they would. Um, so Canadian agricultural exports were very strong last year. And then this last figure on the, on the uh, far end is food price inflation. So this is the consumer price index percentage change year over year. The blue line is what happened in 2018-19. The red line is food price inflation 2019 to 2020. And you can see that in most months, the rate of food price inflation was actually below the previous year. So food prices were very stable in 2020 relative to, to history. You know, so these pictures tell us that production was strong, trade was strong, prices were stable, okay? And at the farm level, we also, we don't know for sure because we don't have tax data yet, but Agriculture Canada is forecasting that farm level income is actually approaching or at record levels this year. Um, so net cash income at the farm and then farm family income, which is the farm component of income and then the off farm component are both up considerably this year. And I think Alan will spend some more time talking about that in his presentation. So how did it hold up? Well, I think a lot of us were who, who were actually quite confident that the system would hold up well, were even surprised by how well it held up. You know, along the dimensions of quantity and variety and prices of food, you know, there were really no, other than very short-term stockouts, no shortages of food. Prices were stable, trade flows held up, borders for trade and food were, were relatively open, and farm incomes were very strong in 2020. Um, so, you know, the early calls that, you know, I, I showed a few examples early on, some of the early calls that, that were calling for things like transformational changes, changes in farm subsidy programs, seem to have been mostly unwarranted. Um, and you know, looking back, it seems a lot of them were motivated by things other than 
um, you know, a call or, or a need for more resilience or more food security. There were sort of often ulterior motives to these things. You know, people that had preferences for smaller scale or whatever were sort of capitalizing on this um, as, as an avenue for, for change. And, you know, just to sum up, I've taken a quote here out of, this is one of my favorite quotes out of the whole uh, special issue. This is from um, the Deaton and Deaton one on food security. And they, they sum up a lot of that argument very well in, in their abstract. And the statement is the oversimplified conflation of food insecurity concerns with the robustness of our food supply system does a disservice to ongoing efforts to address food insecurity, as well as our capacity to assess and improve the Canadian food system. So I will wrap it up there and, and Jill and Alan will speak more specifically about the papers that they wrote and then we can we can all answer questions about uh, some of the other papers uh, with interest. So thank you, Anamika. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan. That, that's definitely uh, interesting. And I would like to welcome now to come to the screen, Dr. Jill Hobbs. And uh, Jill is a professor in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of Saskatchewan. She holds a PhD in Agricultural Economics from the University of Aberdeen in the UK. Her research areas include agri-food supply chain, consumer behavior, and food policy. She is a fellow of the Canadian Agricultural Economics Society. The floor is all yours, Jill. Thank you, and uh, um, I appreciate the invitation to participate. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting session. So the paper I wrote a year ago uh, examined somewhat speculatively at the time, of course, um, what might happen with food supply chains uh, given the COVID-19 pandemic. And a year into that pandemic, we can now look back and, and, and see what we've learned about supply chain resilience. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, briefly today. So if we can move to the next slide. So I'm just going to talk about these three topics. Um, examine some of the short run demand and supply shocks that got a lot of attention in the early stage of the pandemic, but were in fact short run effects. Uh, and then what we learned about adaptability and resilience. And then I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some long run thoughts in terms of any changes that might be more long run versus transient. So in, in the short run, when the pandemic uh, first hit, we, and Ryan's alluded to this a little bit, we saw some fairly significant um, um, demand and supply shocks to the food system. And probably the major demand shock was the, the one that Ryan's already alluded to, a sudden massive shift of food expenditures from uh, food service to food retail. So food away from home expenditures, cafes, restaurants and so forth. As people were working from home, avoiding uh, going out, and as of course lockdowns occurred, we saw, saw that huge shift. That's important um, because certainly prior to the pandemic, those food expenditures on food service accounted for about a third of food expenditures for Canadian households. If we look at the US, it was about 50%. So that's a, that's a major shift of food expenditures from one type of food supply chain, if you like, to another. And that was exacerbated in the short run, and this was short run, um, by some panic buying hoarding behaviors by consumers responding um, perhaps to a lot of the uncertainty that was um, uh, pervasive at the time, not knowing what would happen. Uh, I think some of the um, commentary that, that Ryan alluded to probably didn't help in terms of, of, uh, of, of, of creating or, or adding to that uncertainty. And there's been some interesting um, observations from psychology about so, so what we call herd behavior. So do consumers react to what they think other consumers are doing? So that in some sense exacerbated some of those effects and we all saw short run stockouts, um, uh, retail stores, people um, people stocking up on dry goods and, and so forth. And what that required was a realignment of those food supply chains. And you now to give you a, a couple of examples we have, for example, in the egg sectors, um, breaker eggs, are, are, are destined for the food service sector versus table eggs that go to food retail. Um, so there's that breaker egg market suddenly disappeared overnight, okay? Um, in the chicken sector, for example, those roasting chickens that you buy in the supermarkets, so sort of three pound, 1.5 kg chickens um, versus deboned chickens or um, cut up chicken markets. Those are, those are often um, different bird specifications, different weights, people growing birds for different markets and so forth. So we saw a lot of, um, uh, issues with food supply chains having to suddenly adapt and adjust and, and change towards supplying food retail. 
Other constraints were, as Ryan alluded to, package sizes. If you think about, uh, in, in, if you're at Starbucks, you're looking at the kind of milk, uh, the size the milk packages come in. Clearly, that's a different size than we see for um, for food retail or flour. Flour, um, there's shortage of uh, retail bags, retail size flour bags. So that supply chains took time to to um, to adjust. I think it's important to think about how agricultural supply chains differ from uh, other manufacturing supply chains, say car manufacturing supply chains. And a couple of the important components when we think about the agriculture sector are, it, it, it's, these are biological processes um, and they're often highly perishable goods, right? So uh, in the sense, there's little flexibility in the very short run to adjust production to these sudden exogenous shocks. Chicks have been hatched, calves have been bred, crops have been seeded and so forth, uh, and it takes a little bit of time to adapt. And if we add on top of that perishability, say fruit and vegetable sectors, um, and that, that also creates some, some challenges. So those are some of the, 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 the demand side shocks and, and the, you know, the, the, the challenges the food supply chain uh, or food system may have had in adjusting. I think the other major um, effect we saw on the supply side were labor force outbreaks of COVID-19, particularly in meat packing plants. Um, um, certainly saw that in Canada, more so in the US, um, but certainly we saw that here in beef and hog packing plants and so forth. Um, and, and again, why, why is that an issue? Well, we, we take one of those large packing plants out of um, production, even just for a few days. That's going to um, reduce the demand for cattle, pushing the cattle prices down. It's going to uh, reduce the supply of uh, meat on the retail market, pushing those prices up. So we saw those price spreads widening a little bit sort of through late April, early May of last year. And that's entirely normal. That's what we'd expect to see happen uh, in this sector. But I want to emphasize the short run um, part of this because by and large, those effects settled out. And as Ryan showed you in some of those graphics, we saw retail prices return. That's all that blip maybe in April to May, returning to normal through the summer. Same with true of cattle prices and so forth. But again, this is a major exogenous shock. It takes time for these supply chains to adapt. So what do we learn about adaptability and resilience? Um, I completely agree with Ryan. I think we see that the food system was actually remarkably resilient given the size of those exogenous shock. Um, and, and again, there's calls for we should change the food system, we should focus on smaller scale. I think we need to be very cautious about, um, about those types of um, arguments, I guess, because we need to sort of think about the underlying economics of the sector. So um, for example, there are certainly economies of scale and scope advantages for larger firms. So what does that mean? Uh, if you're a larger firm, you can spread your fixed costs over a lot larger um, throughput, that's going to lower costs and lower prices for consumers. And those larger firms often produce a wider range of products that can spread those costs over the larger range of products. Um, and I think one of the, the, the learnings that came out of the pandemic is that you know, if we think about a, a local or regional food system, there's probably not a lot of evidence that, that would have fared any better faced by the same exogenous shock. Those, um, let's take meat processing, for example, can be subject to the same kind of labor vulnerabilities that we see in the, in the larger processing plants. Um, certainly we saw, as Ryan alluded to, cross-border supply chains functioned remarkably well, and that was certainly a cause of concern a year ago. How would that work? And that worked very well. I think there was important policy move to, um, with essential worker designations to uh, free up movement across the border for, for those involved in food supply chains. Those are really important moves, I think, to continue to help those supply chains continue functioning across the border. Um, and when we think about resilience, um, when you think about sort of a trade off between resilience during normal times versus resilience during abnormal times, and, and, and you know, not, not, not just focusing on one aspect of, of, of resilience in that sense. So in terms of long run um, implications, uh, I think the pandemic has really highlighted the interconnectedness of, of supply chains, uh, um, particularly across the North American market. We see our hog sector, fruits and vegetables quite integrated across that border. That was a source of strength um, for those sectors in riding out um, some of the short and medium term effects of the pandemic. Um, there is, I think, some cause to think about what were the points of vulnerability and certainly labor force outbreaks in large processing plants seem to be a point of vulnerability. So uh, I'm, I'm moved to thinking about, uh, you know, what we've already seen that, of course, social distancing, 
um, and other measures in processing plants. I think probably what we'll see is more focus on you know, um, would automation in those processing plants reduce that risk? To what extent is that um, technically feasible uh, and also economically feasible? Has the fact that we may have slower processing line speeds now, for example, change that calculus in terms of the relative cost of labor, for example? Um, the other obvious long run change has been, of course, the shift towards online food delivery. Um, and my guess would be that's probably here to stay for a couple of reasons. Um, consumers, you know, we've sort of jumped up the technology adoption curve, if you like, for um, consumers who maybe have been reluctant to try online food delivery before, tried it and it works for them, that may well continue doing that. And perhaps more significantly, we've seen um, investment in that infrastructure by food retailers and third parties that, um, uh, that that's likely here to stay. And then the last point I'd make is, again, I'd echo the, the point that Ryan ended on. Um, certainly a lot of concern uh, from the pandemic about food insecurity. And that's, that's primarily an income problem. It's not a food system problem. And I think that's a really important point to emphasize. I'm glad, Ryan, that you put that uh, in the slide at the end there, um, that, that we see challenges from, from incomes and policies, therefore, to address the income problem. It doesn't necessarily mean there's been a problem with the food system. So I will um, I will leave it there just with the, that past that ending thought. And again, thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you so much, uh, Jill, for your presentation. Uh, very interesting. And next up, we welcome Dr. Ellen Kerr. And Ellen obtained a joint PhD in economics and statistics at North Carolina State University and has worked as a professor at University of Arizona and University of Guelph. His research interests are varied, having published in leading academic journals ranging from agricultural economics, economics, statistics, probability, law, animal science, and even plant science. So please go ahead, Alan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having me, uh, both Ryan and Anamika. I appreciate uh, the invite. Um, so this, uh, what I'm going to talk today about is Canadian BRM programs. And for those of you not familiar with that, those are the uh, government programs that are currently exist to assist farmers in managing risk. And so, um, so when the pandemic came along, we were certainly very curious of whether these programs would hold up or not, whether they be financially stable or not during this, during COVID, and how they would uh, would go about. So, if we take a step back and just look at these programs, they're sort of divided into four separate programs. So the first one, Agri-Invest, is basically where a producer can put a small amount of money into a savings account and it's matched by the, uh, by the government. And so that's sort of the first uh, avenue of which maybe farmers can can go to the savings account to assist them and for what we might call shallow losses. Uh, the next program, the next two, AgriStability and AgriInsurance are the main programs. Uh, AgriStability is a net margin farm, not commodity level uh, insurance program, and it's pretty much fully subsidized by uh, the government, federal and provincial governments. AgriInsurance is like a traditional crop insurance program and it is heavily subsidized as well, 60% premium subsidy. And then uh, the federal government and provincial governments and uh, the last three uh, policy frameworks have what's called agri-recovery. And that's sort of uh, a program that can kind of be a catch-all for everything not covered for the others should the governments wish to trigger it. And it is government triggered and basically uh, meant to be able to come in and handle catastrophic losses. Uh, so these are funded with the 60-40 split between federal and provincial governments. Um, and of course, supply managed commodities that don't really face much risk. So there's very little participation into these programs from those. Okay, next slide. Um, so 
Now that we have an understanding of the programs, there was some significant calls uh, for industry for huge funds of money to be placed into these programs, a lot more than what has gone in in the past. And as Ryan pointed out, and, and I've here too, the CFA asked for an additional 2.6 billion uh, as a first phase of support above any existing BRM programs that are now. Uh, the Grain Farmers of Ontario ran ads stating the food supply chain is breaking, prices are unstable and collapsing, facing another dread dreadful year and will Canada lose its farm? So there was a lot of uh, talk and rhetoric out there about uh, that these programs would fall apart or, or farms would fall apart without sufficient funds going into these programs. So if we kind of look back over the year to see what's happened during, uh, during 2020 and up to, to right now, uh, we see farming savings account actually increased, not a lot, but increased to over 2.4 billion um and so they didn't draw down these accounts during uh during the pandemic we saw that even participation in uh the risk management programs by the federal government uh dropped an increase even though sign up was moved from april to july so um th that's rather interestingly and telling uh, farm income uh, over this past year, as Ryan, Ryan uh, alluded to, uh, is expected to be up 22%. Um, and uh, household farm income up 9%. And as a bit of a backdrop, the ratio of farm to non-farm household income has been increasing over the past three decades steadily and is roughly at around two. So um, farm income to non-farm household income is roughly double and the wealth is roughly four times as much. So, okay, thank you. Um, so what risk did we see? Well, uh, Ryan and Jill pointed these out. Uh, and so just quickly, there was a decrease in demand for ethanol, which caused a temporary decrease in the corn price. Uh, temporary processing capacity shortages in beef and hog uh, caused uh, a bigger spread between, let's say, the retail and the producer price and downward pressure on the producer price. And then we had issues, big concerns about the supply of temporary farm workers. So these were risks that were faced. So um, what did the government do? So um, they did a lot of a lot of measures, but not anything that would be classified as as very big or dumping of a huge amount of money into uh, into farm programs like what was asked. So uh, they uh, increased uh, interim agri stability payments from 50 to 75%. So basically that's, if they're getting a payment, they're, um, they can qualify for uh, an interim payment because payments take a, a while with agri stability. And so they were able to get a little more. Uh, the government set aside 125 million in that agri recovery program to assist uh, hog and cattle farmers with additional feed expenses from processing delays. But interestingly, uh, is we're unable to tell whether much of that money has actually uh, uh, been applied for yet by farmers. Um, agri insurance was augmented to include labor shortages. Uh, for the horticulture sector. That's with respect to the temporary farm workers. But while temporary farm workers as a whole is down this year uh, versus last year, it's still uh, above the five-year average. So um, the federal government provided $50 million to farmers who are bringing in temporary farm workers to help with those expenses. Uh, and two other things, the Farm Credit Canada, this was one of the first programs that was announced, was given an additional $5 billion in lending capacity. Uh, but there's no, there's no evidence that uh, uh, a lot was, uh, a lot of that extra lending capacity was accessed by farmers, nor needed, uh, given what we're, we're seeing about uh, revenues. Anyway, and uh, for those farmers that had an outstanding advanced payments program, this is in March of 2020, uh, they were given like a six month stay. Uh, but th these programs were amounted to very little. 
very little to farmers. So um, certainly looking a year back, uh, in fact, the tone of the industry has changed to, um, uh, they're not arguing that the BRM programs were are underfunded because of COVID. They're now arguing that BRM programs need to be more funded for economic recovery. So um, a conclusion would be that uh, COVID-19 this past year didn't really expose any gaps in BRM programming. And, uh, and there doesn't appear to be any need because of COVID-19 for further funding uh, of these programs, any additional funding to these programs. So uh, thanks again. For, for having me, really appreciate it, so. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Alan. So I would like to call upon Ryan and Jill to come back uh, on the screen. And uh, so uh, then we can open it up for uh, a general discussion uh, by the group. And um, so uh, perhaps I could um, start out with, uh, I think, very simple question. Um, so you're, you're talking about the, the special uh, issues. So, so there are two of them, or one is uh, forthcoming uh, shortly. And um, so, so do you need to be an expert in, in uh, ag economics to actually understand the articles? Uh, and, and if so, uh, that might be difficult for, for some of them, that for some of us to, to, to get access to information. And would you be planning to maybe put something out that is readily accessible to the, to the general public? So I, I can take that one. Uh, and the, the short answer is everyone should be able to read uh, most of these articles. We, we intentionally asked the authors to leave out technical modeling and you know Alan sort of says no math no no calculus etc uh, so so they're all uh, targeted towards uh, sort of government level uh, employees popular press so it, it was intentionally it, it is not you know a technical academic issue at all it is accessible to to a wide audience thanks that that I, that's great that's great to know I'm so sorry add? Yeah, no, 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 yeah. And in yeah. fact, uh, three of the articles of the new issue have already been picked up in stories in the Western producer over the last week and a half, 10 days. So, um, and some of the articles from the first issue were also picked up by um, uh, the, the general press as well. So not, not just an economic audience as Ryan says. So. Yeah, that's that's good to know because I'm sure some people are online and and uh, they may not have uh, have seen it just yet and uh, and uh, there's an encouragement uh, for them to do so since it is uh, understandable for a broad uh, audience. So another um, thing that I was wondering while, while listening to you, um, I'm wondering how environment is is taking uh, taken into consideration in in your models, and and the question comes from so so you're doing some modeling and you're looking at the impact of a pandemic uh, uh, on, on certain factors, and, and and so I can imagine if you are dealing with um, a, a client or a weather that we would say weather normal year. Uh, there might be a different impact than, uh, than when we would be dealing with that exact same pa pandemic, but, but it would be a year that there is uh, severe droughts in, uh, in, in you know, parts of Canada or severe flooding. And, and so could you comment on um, whether or not um, environment is somehow uh, taken into consideration? And I'm particularly thinking about the utility of, of models uh, for for prediction in that regard. Uh, so I'll take a stab at that. I'm not sure if if you mean uh, consideration of environment and weather as an input into agricultural production, or um, with regards to the effect of agricultural production on the environment. So if, if you're talking, the, 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 the first, yeah, the, the first. first. So, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's just as an example, for example, Alan's paper uh, discusses, well, he can probably speak to this much better than me, but he discusses, so if it were to be a bad year um, and, and yields were down or, and or prices were down or trade, trade barriers rose up, and that could affect farm level incomes. You know, what Alan tried to do in his paper is discuss, well, given the current system of subsidy programs and risk management programs, would they hold up? And, you know, he can speak to that more clearly, but certainly, 
the, as those environmental factors affect income, our models account for that and our discussions and Alan's discussion would account for that. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and I did talk a bit about that for sure. Would they, is there enough uh, in the bank, enough reserves in these programs and that to handle uh, a bad weather year at the same time and things like that? And uh, there, there is uh, to handle multiple really bad years just because of the design of uh, of these business risk management programs. Um, unknowingly, I would argue, unknowingly designed that created such surpluses that you even see in Alberta right now. I don't know if you heard, but they're, uh, uh, we don't have a speaker on from Alberta, but they're, they're giving back 20% of the premiums to the farmers to these programs because they've collected too much over the last 20 years and things like that. And so certainly in risk management, whenever we're doing the modeling of these things, in fact, uh, this comes into play, uh, the weather comes into play uh, um, to, to a large degree. And specific, interestingly, I'm just looking at something right now where we're looking at twice daily weather updates. Um, and using the the IBM's 14-day uh, forecast at a section level and things like that to um, predict yields at time of harvest uh, throughout the growing season, and uh, and so it's uh, yeah as well as satellite imagery data to to looking at the uh, the NDVI of of uh, the crop growth and things like that so. Yep, they're a big right. part of the, the risk models for sure. Because they cause the risk. Yes, yes. Um, and then um, Jill, um, I, I was interested in, um, you were talking about food systems and, and that uh, that there is an advantage sometimes to have um, uh, perhaps what we call large companies uh, in, in terms of uh, food systems and resilience. And the question I have, uh, you know, with a lot of things uh, in the world, um, you know, we tend to think that the greater diversity, the more resilient uh, systems are. And, and, and so the question I have for you, um, do you think that uh, it's best to maximize diversity within the food system or, or do you actually say that that larger companies um, um, are are sufficient to to address the um, uh, security of the food system? Well, I think you have to remember. Or I guess the point I was trying to make is the larger companies are going to have these economies of scale advantages, so they're going to be a more efficient, lower cost system. So you could have a more diverse, diversified smaller health food system, but it's going to be started at a higher level cost. So, you know, there's a trade off there in that sense. I'm not sure that a more diverse system would be more resilient to that kind of shock. I mean, I, that, that it, it might be, but not necessarily. And you can think of other, you know, climate related shocks that might be very regional. So if you have a regional food system, it might be more less resilient because because it's it's more regional. So I think, you know, there's obviously some trade offs there in terms of how we think about that. But a really important point would be, you know, if you've got a, um, an efficient food system that's lower cost, that's lower prices for consumers, um, you know, let's not throw that away just because we are concerned about some of these other issues. So that, I guess that was the point I was trying to get at. Uh, mm -hmm. now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I, I do see uh, time fly, so I, I just want to make sure to get back to uh, Crystal and, and maybe reminding us on how the audience can, um, can also ask uh, questions. Thank you, Anamika. Uh, yeah, so uh, you'll want to visit slido.com and you'll see the URL at the bottom of your screen. When you're there, enter the event code, which is hashtag ag markets. Uh, and please uh, add your question in there. Um, we uh, at, Initially, we asked where were people watching from? Most people seem to be watching from the Winnipeg area. And I believe uh, our one viewer who's Harry from, I think he's watching us from Winkler. Um, and uh, I'll just maybe read a, one or two of the comments and just see if we can, uh, our questions here. Um, so the one comment was, farmers get quite upset when people talk about gross receipts being so high and don't include the on-farm costs. Net incomes are down. I know, had a discussion. 
Um, I don't know if anyone has a comment on that comment. That sounds like a, a comment for Alan. He, he knows the farm income data, I think, quite well. Yeah, um, sure. And in one sense, it is half the discussion uh, because of what we're not, where, what isn't uh, easily calculable is is the cost. Uh, we're basing it off of what the federal government is is issue, is is publicizing, and that's where we get our data. But certainly. Um, you know, costs year to year, while well, they can go up with energy costs or down with energy costs and things like that. Um, it seems to be that uh, that the driver in volatility, a bigger driver, I wouldn't say uh, a complete driver, not saying that by any means, uh, is uh, the outputs. So the output price and output yield and seems to be a little more stable than the input, uh, the input costs. And so um, I don't have data on the input costs. Uh, that hasn't been, uh, been released by, uh, by Ag Canada. Um, so in that sense, I can't really speak to that. I can speak to the fact that, uh, that uh, certainly uh, farm incomes and farm wealth are much higher than non-farm, and uh, and so it does bring into uh, questions of the subsidies flowing from non-farm to farm. Okay, and that kind of leads to our next question, um, talking about a comparison between Canada and the U.S., for example. How does Canada remain competitive in the global market given the massive subsidies paid to U.S. farmers? I, I can take a, a shot at that. Um, it, that's a hard, complicated question to answer. So certainly in some products, Canadian producers are not competitive and in other products they are. Uh, so there are a lot of things that go into determining the competitiveness of producers in any country, You know, one of which is just natural sort of productive advantages, weather and soil and, and labor costs and things like that. And for some products, Canada has, has strong advantages in that for things like field crops and um, and of course, competing with producers in other countries who receive subsidies decreases any advantages that, that Canadian producers might have. But it's important too to understand that Canadian producers are heavily subsidized, uh, but often in different and, and, and supported by government policies, but often in different ways that are not as transparent. So, you know, US farm subsidies are very easy to measure and observe because they show up in a farm bill on the government balance sheets. The way in that Canadian producers are supported often don't show up in those balance sheets. So they, you know, if you look at international comparisons, there are a number of organizations that do this, like the OECD, and they look at sort of the ag average measures of government support provided to producers. And the support provided to Canadian producers rivals and in many years exceeds that in the US. It's just that it's, it's, uh, it's not as transparent in many cases, especially for certain products. And so there's this perception that US farmers are heavily subsidized, which in fact they are. Um, and, and we discuss how that changed during the pandemic. Um, but, you know, for some products, Canadian producers are very competitive, even giving, given uh, subsidies in other countries. Um, and in other products, they're, they're just not. So it's, it's a very hard layered question to answer. Okay, well, as we wait for more questions to come in, I'm, I'm just gonna throw a question at you too. And this is just from my own personal experience. I don't know how it ties into how the markets have reacted, but we've certainly changed a lot about how we consume. And I think you talked on this. Um, we, we are doing a lot more delivery. Um, we're doing meal kits a lot more. And how does that impact our food systems? Is that just something they're adapting to? And will that, do you think that's the way forward? Is that going to stick? I'll take that one if you like. Um, no, I mean, I, I certainly think that, um, as I said, the online delivery, that's, that, I think that's, that's here to stay, um, uh, as well as that growth in that meal kit business. I think you'll see some consumers shifting back once, once restaurants, once they're comfortable going out to restaurants, once vaccinations are rolled out, that, that will probably um, pull back a little bit in terms of that, that market segment. But, um, but, you know, certainly we're seeing a lot of innovation in that, in that sector. Um, one of the, the things we're seeing coming out of the pandemic is what we call multi-channel shopping. So consumers uh, getting their food and other products from both online and, and, and all sorts of other ways. And I think that 
again, that's that's there to stay. I see that as creating opportunities. It creates opportunities for different you know types of supply chains to con connect with consumers, which is uh, you know adds diversity to the food system, which is um, which is in some sense beneficial. Um, I, interesting. I'm teaching a couple of undergraduate classes this year, and the students have been talking about these issues in in online discussions, and some of them. Their view is that uh, online shopping is just what old people do. I think my students think old an old person is someone who's over forty. I'm not imagining, <laughs> sure. and that, that will disappear and everyone will go back to the store. And I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that. And others think no, no, this is here to stay. But uh, but it has been interesting looking at how you know younger uh, students, these are third, fourth year undergrads, are thinking about these types of changes in the food system. And certainly some of them have mentioned the meal kits as something they've tried and their friends have tried and they seem to enjoy. It. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I have, an, um, I guess, another question. Uh, you, you talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. market. And I and, uh, just wonder if you could also make uh, perhaps a comparison on how the markets in Canada fare relatively to, let's say, the European market or markets. Uh, well, I, you know, I uh, broadly speaking, most industrialized countries, uh, you know, rich sort of rich countries fared very well. Uh, the borders remained open, production flowed fairly well. I, I think one of the big differences between a place like Canada and the United States and maybe the European Union too, is how governments in those areas responded to the pandemic. So in the United States, for example, um, there was a lot of ad hoc programming put in place in response to what well, turned out maybe not to be as big a disruption as some people anticipated. And and to be honest, I'm not sure, I, I don't have expertise in the European market. I'm not, I know Jill is European. I'm not sure how closely she follows it, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the EU response was uh, in, in much detail. I'm not sure if Alan or Jill do. I, I think it was, I think you're right, Ryan, it was fairly similar in terms of the, the cross-border supply chains continue to work pretty well. I mean, I actually was having, I happened to be in the UK on sabbatical when the pandemic first started, and you certainly saw the same kinds of short-run supply and demand shocks that, that we saw here with the shift um, to, to food retail and so forth. But um, I think it's a different story maybe when we look at developing countries with, with less developed um, food systems, and that's, uh, that's something maybe Ryan's more... Um, uh, tune to them or works on that I do but, but yeah I think it, it, similarly fairly successful um, story of resilience then those food systems mm -hmm. and you were um, uh, mentioning um, I guess food insecurity and that's that it is an uh, income problem and um, um, I, I I know what you what you mean, and I appreciate that you uh, brought that up. And I'm saying Jill, but I think Ryan also um, uh, perhaps mentioned that. And, and so, would you have any um, ideas on uh, as economists uh, on how to uh, proceed in 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 solving that and uh, improving food security for a, a larger number of people? Whether we talk about within Canada. Uh, but if you want, you could also speak uh, more broadly in the world. Uh, boy, that's a that's a big question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> another another virtual no, conversation. I <laughs> uh, but I you know I do a lot of some of my research is related to those kinds of issues on food aid, um, and you know, as as has come up many times, food insecurity, even in developing countries. Uh, where markets are incomplete and um, yields are low is almost always, not always, but almost always a function of income, not a function of food supply or production. So, you know, I encourage people to separate those two discussions as that quote I put in by Deaton and Deaton, you know, subsidizing domestic food production is not a solution to food insecurity. Um, you know, policies to affect income, you know, Brady and Brady and Brady Deaton in the, in the journal, they, they focus on the Canadian aspect of food security. And, you know, the, the main thing they talk about is how incomes were affected by the pandemic. Um, and so in Canada, the government intervened in many ways to offset some negative income effects from job losses and closures. And, you know, incomes held up fairly well. In developing countries where governments do not have the capacity to do that, the effects are much more severe, um, and you know people there might be more reliant on um, 
private sector or, or sort of black market under the table employment that has disappeared and not have access to public, uh, public funding um, income support programs. So the effects are much more serious there than they, they would be here in a place like Canada. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I see some further questions, I believe. Uh, Crystal, back to you. Thank you. Uh, question, uh, based on Alan's comments, does that mean Canadian ag econ researchers academics will not support continued back-end subsidies from non-ag sector to ag sector? And I think this is the follow-up. If I posted the answer to my question on Twitter, farmers would go ballistic. They did the last time this happened. Well, let me first start by that I don't represent all Canadian ag, re ag econ researchers in academics. Um, and so I'll, I'll state that uh, and I'll let uh, the others answer for themselves. So um, the point I was trying to make is that there was significant calls like very heavy handed calls for significant monies, uh, additional monies uh, to the sector uh, without uh, these risks, um, you know, uh, being called that farms are going to go away and, uh, and that the supply was going to break and this and that. Um, and uh, calling for more money. And uh, certainly the, re the data, the experience over the past year does not suggest that that was warranted. I think it's maybe worth emphasizing that a lot of uncertainty, you know, looking back a year, it's, no one really knew how this was going to play out. And I think the ag sectors performed remarkably well to be you know, yeah. uh, pleased in some senses that, 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 that the outcome is what it is, right? So, yes, very you know, pleased. Learn from that. Very pleased. They say, so, hey, yeah. this, was, this was a success story, a big success story. It was. And I think also a, a lesson from Alan's paper in the journal in the special issue is that certainly, like Jill said, we, there was a lot of uncertainty. We, we certainly didn't know how incomes and production would hold up. But I think one of one of the important points that Alan made is that even if things went sideways, much worse than they did, the current suite of risk management programs would have held up, right? So uh, in a way that could have stabilized farm income had things gone much worse. Yeah, through agri-recovery, definitely, yeah. where they can come in and do some things uh, in real time to s stabilize things without having to change the entire uh, BRM programs. So they have that uh, avenue to go down uh, to make those happen in, in real time. So, you know, one of the things we learned through this is that the markets were nimble and, and changed quickly and responded quickly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been teaching policy for a long time and, and government policies are not nimble. So any time we want to consider a big sort of transformational or major change to a policy on trade or subsidies or anything, we have to have good evidence to support it. And you know, given what we just experienced there, there is really not evidence to support big changes to those policies now. Thank you. Uh, so it's almost uh, 4.30. Uh, so it is time for us to uh, wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Alan, uh, Ryan you. and Jill for your uh, presentations. Uh, and uh, teaching us or at least me a little bit more about uh, economics so uh, i enjoyed uh, listening to you um so i want to um, uh, also thank the audience for uh, for joining us today and uh, your time is very much uh, appreciated i uh, hope that uh, you have uh, enjoying uh, this conversation and we have at least one more scheduled and uh, that will take place uh, around mid-May and we will be uh, inviting Dr. Jim House from the Department of Food and Human Nutritional Sciences. And Jim currently leads the Manitoba Protein Research Strategy Project and he will be joining by two colleagues to talk about the sustainable protein research ecosystem in Manitoba. So I'm looking uh, forward to having that conversation uh, with them. So please watch for uh, updates on our websites or, or social media accounts. Uh, and uh, again, you can visit makemanitoba.ca to make it uh, easier for you.
Uh, if you uh, have not uh, already signed up and are not receiving the Ag e news, you, you can actually uh, email us and, and sign up. And on your screen, you see the email address that you can uh, utilize for that. And with that, uh, I want to thank you all again, both the speakers and the participants for joining me here today. And I wish you a good evening and good night. Thank you.